Friday to come up with a new community. to what I'm trying to bring to you 
So, first of all, I want to make the point that we're living in uncharted waters. We live in a world that's never been experienced by the human species before, or the planet before. Number two, I believe the primary goal of the Western world is growth, economic growth, fueled by science and technology. Actually, it's fueled by fossil fuels, at least 85% uh, uh, of our uh, energy comes from fossil fuels. But when I say it's fueled by science and technology, what I mean is that science is misused in removing limits to growth. That's what allows the growth to take place in an otherwise uh, situation where uh, we wouldn't be able to grow. And I believe that that growth is the root cause of most existential threats that we have any control over. Uh, uh, and it's the scale of our human enterprise that's at that root cause, right? Too many of us wanting too much, as Leonard Cohen says. Everybody wants a box of chocolates and a long stem rose, right? And there's lots of us. Uh, I'm very often accused of being a, a pessimist, and, and I say, oh yes, yeah, probably true. I like to think that I'm a realist. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to show that in, in just covering some of the main events that have happened over the last week. Uh, the UN Secretary General opened the 27th World Conference on, on the Climate Crisis with the words, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. At the same time that the COP27 is going on, uh, the leaders of the 20 wealthiest nations are discussing the recent cooling of relations between the two superpowers, China and the US, and the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. This invasion of the Ukraine uh, is threatening now the energy supplies of several European countries, and it's threatening the food security of other nations, especially in Africa. Russia and North Korea are making threats of using nuclear weapons. Trump is going to announce it, and I think is announcing right now, uh, whether or not he's going to run for the presidency. Today, if you don't know it, was the day we reached 8 billion people. This is a very auspicious day. Interestingly enough, I couldn't find anything relating to the fact that we reached 8 billion people today in either the Globe and Mail or in the Saskatoon Star Phoenix, or on the, the CBC radio, other than what I mentioned in an interview this morning. Strange. In terms of things that are happening closer on, uh, this week we had a woman banned for entering the legislative building because her t-shirt carried the statement, abortion is health care. We also discovered that a tax-supported school is teaching that humans and dinosaurs roam the planet together. This is insanity. All of this is insanity. E.O. Wilson is, is famous for, for being the optimist. And he says, I believe we will choose wisely a civilization able to envision God and to embark on a colonization of space will surely find a way to save the integrity of this planet. I'm a pessimist for exactly the same reasons that he gives for being an optimist. So here are the Western goals and beliefs that, that, that I want to talk about tonight. I mentioned the first goal uh, already, that continued exponential growth is probably our primary goal. Every politician you hear will talk about 
economic growth as being one of the prime uh, attributes of what he, is, he or she is proposing to do. We believe that the human species is at the center of all things. For most of uh, uh, our time on the planet, uh, uh, we certainly believe that, and it was a, a strong belief of most religions. We also believe that our political system is democratic. I'd like to uh, suggest to you that it's far from it. We also believe that all personal beliefs have equal validity. I don't buy that. We celebrate things like personal freedom, power, competition, celebrities, supreme beings, kings and queens, the Pope and political leaders sometimes. We trust in hope, faith, prayer, and unsubstantiated beliefs. Daniel Quinn gives us these two basic worldviews. First of all, some of us believe that the world was made for us and we have the God-given right to do whatever we want with it. The alternative is those who believe that the earth is a sacred place and we are but one part of it. I think these two basic differences in worldview uh, result in a great difficulty when we're talking with someone else. If you have a different worldview, it's almost like talking to somebody from another planet. It makes it very difficult. So, we talked about the curve that needs to be flattened. This is a curve of the world population over the last 12,000 years. You see that it's, maybe I can use this pointer, it's relatively flat and then it rapidly flex upwards and we are now at 8 billion people as of today. This curve uh, could easily be a curve of our energy usage, the throughput of materials, extinction rates, the rural urban shift, disparity in incomes, eco-migration, expanding deserts, loss of rainforest, etc. These this is the curve of growth, and it's the one that I think we need to flatten. If we made this 200,000 years, perhaps the, uh, uh, the time that, uh, that we as a species could be recognized as homo sapiens, and made the units of one year equal one person on the vertical axis, we're going to do the population up this way, this graph, if it was one meter wide, would be absolutely flat. You couldn't discern any inflection at all until the very end, and then it would be a vertical line that goes 40 kilometers in the air. That's what that's why we're in uncharted waters, right? We're right at the top of that 42 kilometer peak. And we've never been there before. And we don't know what to do about it. Right now, uh, we kind of are facing on climate change and recently on the COVID pandemic. But there are many, many crises that were, are threatening us today, and they all have to be addressed, addressed concurrently or we don't get anywhere. I will read them to you. We call this period of time the Anthropocene, right? The uh, time when humans dominate the planet completely. I'm going to suggest that, uh, sorry, I'm going to suggest the uh, Anthropocene uh, started probably around 1800, and uh, we don't know when and where it will end. So this is what 
the world looks like to me. We have a few people, very wealthy people, in charge of a great machine that sucks in resources, sucks in human labor, spits out consumer junks, and spits out pollution and CO2 emissions, and destroys the living environment as it puts along. The economy, in most textbooks, completely ignores this input and output. Not a good way to formulate our economic paradigm. The uh, modern techno-industrial society is a human construct. It bears no real resemblance to the real world, uh, the real biosphere, which supports all of us. Today's level of fossil fuel use in the world produces the energy equivalent to seven Hiroshima atomic bombs every second of every minute of every day. I couldn't believe this when I saw that. It was just repeated by Al Gore at the COP27 summit. Same thing. Uh, I did the math on it. I don't get this answer. I made the mistake the first time. I thought it was only four per hour. But it turns out, once I redid the math again, I come up with one to two bombs per second. That's still mind-blowing. David Suzuki has been screaming about this for many decades, right? We're trapped in the trunk of a car being driven by a drunk. Historically, over most of the time that we've been on the planet as humans, we rely strictly on muscle power. Just like every other animal species. We recently, over the last few thousands of years, used the muscle power of animals to add to our power. We've gone from a maximum of a third horsepower that can be exerted by a strong human for a short time to Utilizing the muscle power of animals, taking us up to 33 horsepower. Today, any one of us here can get into a machine that has 200 horsepower. Incredible. This is like having 600 slaves, right? At a third of a horsepower per person, We've got, each of us have 600 slaves at our beck and call. Now, if we say those slaves are like human beings, we have the equivalent of, let me see if I remember, uh, 4.8 trillion people on the globe. Not the 8 billion we see, it's the 8 billion plus our 600 slaves, right? 4.8 trillion people. I'm throwing out these big numbers. You need to know how big a billion is. If it was your job to count to a billion, you would die before you even got close if you started when you graduated from high school and took no holidays, no weekends. Eight hours a day, you can't count to a billion. We're talking about 4.8 trillion. It's insane. This exponential growth that we've experienced over the last couple of hundred years uh, is driven, fueled by fossil fuels, right? Prior to, say, 1850, we were dependent still primarily on current wood production, 
we burned wood. Once we got wise to uh, the tremendous power of coal, it rose up. We added oil, we added gas. And now, about 85% of our, of our power comes from burning these fossil fuels. Unfortunately, we're addicted to this. It's going to be very difficult, very difficult, to get off of fossil fuels. So the result of this growth, as I see it, is overshoot. What overshoot means is you've exceeded the biocapacity of the planet to provide for your needs. That's not a good place to be in at all. Right now, the uh, global biocapacity uh, is about 1.6 global hectares per person. Our footprint is 2.8. In order to do that, you have to eat ecological capital. And when you do that, you destroy the ability for future generations to survive, essentially. I think it's a great thing that people are paying attention to climate change right now. We've got it out in front of us on a daily basis. But it's not the only thing that's going on. It's just one symptom of ecological overshoot. Other symptoms, acidifying the oceans, not supplying fresh waters, overfishing the seas, degrading landscapes and arable soils, expanding deserts, and so on. Climate change can't be fixed in isolation from the other symptoms of overshoot. Now, here's where I get pessimistic. <laughs> I don't believe that we can have a complete replacement of fossil fuels in any meaningful time frame where it will address the climate crisis. It's an impossibility theorem. On the other hand, I believe this is good. If we use science and technology to remove limits to growth, let's say somebody comes up with coal fusion out of thin air, unlimited energy, completely safe, no toxic byproducts, it would allow us to continue into our overshoot until we reach some other limit. It would just make it worse. Fifty years, dozens and dozens of climate conferences, this is a bit out of date, uh, international agreements, right? No impact on the rise of CO2. It's all talk. It doesn't seem to matter whether we have government leaders talking about what they need to do to address things like climate change, or whether we're out in the street with our placards yelling and screaming that the governments need to do something, neither one of those seem to be having the effect that we need to have if we're going to address these crises in some meaningful way in a time frame that's reasonable. Uh, there's a, a cartoon showing uh, that Suzuki uh, has, I think, uh, showing a school bus filled with people heading towards a cliff. In a school bus, it doesn't weigh a whole lot. It's got brakes, it's got a steering wheel, and everything else. We're in the biggest ocean liner you can imagine. It doesn't stop very easily. It doesn't turn very easily. It doesn't reverse direction easily at all. 
We use GDP uh, as our measure of productivity, economic growth. It's not a good measure, but it's a measure that is accepted still by most countries. There's a direct relationship between that and oil consumption. That's our addiction, right? That if we're not going to be on oil, the question is, what are we going to be on? And can it be done in a meaningful time period? Unfortunately, it's politically incorrect to speak about human population growth or religious beliefs that are unsupported by science. Why wasn't reaching 8 billion people today the major story blaring out to everybody in the world? We've reached 8 billion people. It was ignored. We've got snow geese here. Six million of them. They weigh two or three pounds. They have no science and technology. They're completely vegetarian. We blame them for the destruction of Arctic ecosystems. That's why we allow hunters to shoot 20 a day in the fall and have opened up a spring season to shoot 20 more a day. No limit on possession because these geese are destroying the planet. How can we possibly think that geese are destroying the planet given what we do as a species? Here's the inequality. During the first nine months of COVID, from March 2020 to December of 2020, these 15 billionaires We find it now. <laughs> These 15 billionaires in America increased their wealth by $442 billion, an average of $29 billion during the first 10 months of COVID, while everybody else suffered. This isn't fair. Elon Musk was a winner here. He went from $25 billion to $154 billion in 10 months because of COVID. That's insane. I like people who can speak truth to power. And my favorite is Greta Thunberg. Right? She says, when she addressed the UN General Assembly, all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. This is Mark Carney's response. Mark Carney, the former governor of the banks of Canada and England, and currently UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. An unusual portfolio, I would suggest. Right? His response? Directly to Greta, continued growth is not a fairy tale. It is a necessity. Christia Freeland, our finance minister in the last budget, increasing Canada's per capita GDP growth is one of the most fundamental aspirations of every Canadian. I hope she didn't count me. The problem is worldview again, right? If you have a worldview that science and technology can do anything, that we, because we're so smart, can think our way out of any problem, we get into problems that maybe we can't get out of. Cities, major problems. This is the former Secretary General of the United Nations. He says, our struggle for global sustainability will be won or lost in the cities. These are two pictures of Shanghai, China. This one in 1984, 
population 6.8 million. This is the same area in 2020, population 27 million. That's exponential growth. This is what it looks like at ground level in Shanghai. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live there. These people are completely cut off from the natural world. Denial, right? This is how Trump gets votes, right? Offer the simple, the wrong. Make America great again, right? The line up. It's hard taking the other route. Information is not the weak link. We're drowning in information. Some of it's accurate, some of it isn't. The problem is sorting that out. I'm going to just rapidly go through again. This is E.O. Wilson. His primary focus was on biodiversity. This is the sixth great extinction. This is what humans looked like 10,000 years ago, prior to the advent of serious agriculture. Wild mammals, we're only looking at mammals now. The biomass of wild animals made up 90% of the terrestrial mammalian biomass. Humans made up less than 1%. Here's what it looks like today. Humans make up 32%, their livestock makes up another 67%, and we're down to maybe 1.5% wild mammals. That's the extinction. There's a, a great pie, one great economy. We don't share it well with other species. We concentrate on the vertebrates, especially mammals, because they're kind of like us. They're cuddly, most of them. But this is what your produce section looks like with bees. This is what it looks like without pollinators. We can't afford to be throwing insecticides around indiscriminately. Our default position is attempting to maintain economic growth and a growing population and somehow getting off of using mainly fossil fuels. If we don't have a plan, a workable plan, a lot of people think this is what it's going to look like. We spend 200,000 years with sharp sticks and sharp stones and fire, and then we go to the moon, maybe Mars. Then we collapse. We go back to sharp sticks and sharp stones and maybe fire. It's not a pretty picture. Uh, I will go through uh, uh, what Ron and I are doing in our place that was covered in, in the kind of introduction. But we live out in the strawberry hills. We try to grow our, our own food. We try to live a more simple life. If everybody on the planet lived like we do, we still need another planet that's Earth-sized and habitable. Good planets are not found easily in this neighborhood. Hmm. One tomato that we grow in our greenhouse, if you bought it at the store, would have cost, uh, cost, I think, six tablespoons of diesel oil to produce it and get it there. Mind you, it's not that big, it's me. <laughs> this is where we would have to go from where, where Ron and I are right now. Uh, we would have to downsize dramatically. We'd be down to a, a one-room house with a small bed and kitchen, uh, electricity for a few small appliances, no central heat, air conditioning for hot water. Well, we don't have air conditioning anyway. Uh, 
uh, local plant-based diet only, right? It's people, wheat, corn, rice, no clothes washer, dryer, or dishwasher, never driving in a car, never flying in a plane. We've given up planes for the last three years, whether or not we can stay that way, I don't know. My conclusion is that the overshoot that we're in can only be addressed by absolute reductions in population, energy, materials, and waste. I don't see any other way. I want to end on a more positive note yeah. uh, and suggest a couple of areas where we could make some inroads. The first is our democratic process. Right? Uh, in the last election, the NDP got 25 seats with 17.8% of the vote. The Bloc got 32 seats with only 7.6% of the vote. If we had proportional representation, the NDP, instead of having 25 seats, would have 90. That's the difference between first past the post and proportional representation. I think we need to replace it with proportional representation as quickly as we can so that everybody's at the table. I don't think we would have necessarily had the truck convoy in Ottawa if they had had seats at the table. And the party that they probably would have voted for should have gotten 12% or 12 seats at that table. Maybe that would have satisfied them. They have a voice. They don't have to go occupy Ottawa. I think we should bring an end to government and loyal opposition model of government. Everybody that gets elected is part of government. It's how Nunavut does it. I think it's a much better model. I think we should have the MPs elect the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is now whoever is leader of the party with the most seats, even whether it's a majority or minority, it doesn't matter. He's, he or she is in a huge conflict of interest. Does he make decisions based on what's good for his party or for Canada? Not a good system. I think we should lower the voting age to 16. It's insane that a 16-year-old can get in a car that weighs over a ton and has 200 horsepower and drive to Ottawa and have sex with their MP, but they can't vote for the MP. That's insane. These are the people that are going to take the brunt of what we've been doing for the last 200 years. Let them vote. Here's the other thing, a more local thing. I've been beating my head against a brick wall about this for uh, since 20 or uh, since 1916. Mawasson spent a, or the city of Saskatoon spent a million dollars on a 100-year plan, one of the most uh, foresighted suggestions that was made was that the uh, university, with the cooperation of the MBA and the city, is capable of a whole new research initiative in community and rural living on the prairies, essentially promoting a model sustainable community. This is compatible with the U.S. vision. Right? The gradual development of a portion of the university lands, and we, we're talking about a thousand acres here, as high quality compact communities is critical to the growth, controlled growth of the city of Saskatoon in accordance with environmental sustainable policies. Uh, the university does not appear to be interested in this. They want to get the most money out of that land that they can possibly get on a long term basis. They want to rent it out. Canada is in an optimum position to model a sustainable way to live on this planet. The question is, will we? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Canada, with the second largest country, a, a population that's less than 40 million, that's less than the city of Tokyo, well-educated, Wealthy, if we can't model sustainability on this planet, it can't be done. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. 
Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Unjustified assumptions, or unjustified assumptions. Um, take it back to start. I can't remember just how you. Oh, that, that would be uh, unsubstantiated beliefs. beliefs. So, what are some of those unsubstantiated beliefs? I'll put you on the spot. Here. Well, you know, after I did uh, the interview this morning on. on Morning edition, uh, Stephanie Landlinger then made that the focus of the of the uh, noon hour call, which was fantastic. One of the people that called in, whose name is Shane, uh, suggested that we got it, I got it all wrong. Right? He read out uh, a piece directly from the Bible that suggested that we're supposed to go forth, multiply, be fruitful and take dominion over the other living things of, of the earth. And when Stephanie uh, kind of questioned him on that, he says, don't worry. Don't worry. We're promised that there's going to be a new world. God's going to take care of it. And, and it's fine for him to believe that. People can believe anything they want. I like to believe in things that have some some semblance of of of, uh, of fact associated with it, some evidence that that belief might be true. If it's a non-substantiated belief, we can believe anything we want. We can believe that we're going to have cold fusion tomorrow, right? Uh, those are the kinds of unsubstantiated beliefs that uh, that I worry about. I might find it more believable yeah, that uh, the Creator would say, you know, if you can't look at, can't look after this one that I built for you, why mm -hmm. would I give you another one? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would add to that as well, and I I would say if you do follow the Bible at all, or you look at the way Jesus lived, it wasn't very grandiose, right? It was very humble, and like from that, if you looked at the way he lived, that would definitely be more along the lines of sustainability, as opposed to you know like just expanding and you know more and more stuff and excessive amounts of things. So I, yeah, I I concur with his point as well. Yeah. I do worry. When it gets in, into these areas of unsubstantiated beliefs, uh, we get into arguments with people that are climate change deniers, for example. How can you not believe that? Look at all the evidence, blah, 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 blah. If at the same time you hold a belief that has no evidence for it whatsoever, it makes it difficult to make that argument. Why is it okay for you to believe that somebody's going to come in and take care of all this stuff for you, uh, but it's not okay for me to deny that humans are causing climate change? Uh, on the other hand, it does not seem that information in and of itself uh, has much impact on changing people's views. If you've got a view and you're talking to someone who has the same view, that's fine. You're talking to someone who gives you all kinds of evidence as to why your view is incorrect. It just drives you the other way. It's it's a it's like a no-win situation. It's the same difference between 
providing hope to people versus my pessimistic fear mongering, right? Which one motivates people? And different <coughs> things motivate people differently. Okay. Uh, okay, so probably most of us in this room, probably you're, you don't need to convince most of us that part, uh, yeah. though it um, might be difficult to convince us, even, even us, whatever we are, um, to give up like our washing machines and that. Um, so yeah, the slide about um, we, what's sustainable, I, I believe if I interpret it right, what's sustainable is one room with few electrical amenities and that. And, and a population of 8 billion people living at North American standards. Right, that's the quality. So still, still, I, okay. Hmm. Yeah, and there's huge discrepancy in standard of living and how we live um, in different places in the world. And that. But I guess the question is, so I'm not sure how that relates to like the whole adaptation we have to make, but how, how then, I don't know, for anyone, I guess this question goes, or this thought about how we encourage and embrace change. Like we have to make some major changes and how we make that like, attractive to people and not just like, okay, you're going to have to lose your house and have no washing machine, etc., etc., etc. Like, how do we actually start to shift the paradigm of like, is it from fossil fuels? Is it reimagining? So yeah, that's, yeah. that's a big issue. I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got, as I see it, you've got two choices. If you want to live like we do today in North America, you have to drop your population down. And according to all of the calculations on biocapacity, that means dropping it down to between one and two billion people. We're at eight billion now. It's easy to get there over a period of several hundred years, slow decline. It's not easy to get there between now and 2050. If you want to share that plan with other species, we're down to a carrying capacity of 750 million people, right? Living at North American standards. I'd like to live at North American standards. I, I'm addicted, just like most of us are. I don't want to give that up. Yes? That, that's assuming a status quo or everything's all stayed the same. You can't just lower the population down. So your advancement, somebody discovers cold fusion. How is this going to help? How would, do you envision that bringing all these things back to some sort of balance? As far as I'm concerned, if we had cold fusion, that's just another way of using science and technology to remove the limit to growth that we're currently limited by. So it's not now we bring the population up to 16 billion, right? Because we've got unlimited energy. We can get anything we want. We can suck it out of seawater if you've got cold fusion. I take, I take the view that, uh, that we've got to give up on most technological fixes. It's not that there isn't good technology. We've got it, right? We've got photovoltaic panels. We've got electric cars. We've got all kinds of, of we've got medicine that's unbelievable, right? We've got, we've got these things. At what point do you say, Okay, we've got enough. Because if we have the opportunity to get more, we want more. There's a biological imperative that if you are getting fed and clothed and, and, and you're relatively happy, you reproduce and, 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 it, and, it, and it continues. Right? It's any species that doesn't do that uh, went extinct a, a long time ago. There's the hope that we're smart enough to figure that out and there's good evidence right now that educating women, taking them out of poverty, will help. The question is, how many billion dollars is Canada willing to contribute towards education of women in reducing poverty in the rest of the world? We spent 500 billion on the COVID. Would we spend 500 billion on that? I don't think so. Most people, when they've done the, uh, uh, done the question, are not willing to spend any more 
than one coffee at Tim Hortons, the cost of one coffee per month at Tim Hortons, that's the maximum the average person in Canada is, going to will, is willing to put forward to address climate change. Doesn't go well. Where'd you get that figure? Somebody did a survey. Could be right, could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's seven, seven Hiroshima bombs a second, maybe it's only two. But I, I think it's, it's probably true. Uh, just, just a second. Yeah, yeah. so I um, listened to you here. Uh, I just recently read uh, Mr. Gary Plowman's book, which uh, you know about probably. And uh, anyway, uh, very good book. I highly recommend it. Like a lot of, a lot of information. But there's almost a collective uh, depression, uh, depressive kind of pathology in our world because there seems to be no escape from this. But, um, well, the escape, no, no, just, the, the escape is easy. Drop the population, drop our consumption of energy and material. No, no, I understand that. But, but politically, and there doesn't seem to be the political will to do that. So uh, my question to you is, uh, you, you've seen these um, pictures of people gluing their hands to, uh, to the wall or throwing tomato soup on paintings. What kind of political action would be effective or efficacious for, for moving this agenda in some sort of timely way? Change democracy, number one. Yeah. Change democracy, and we'll have people in the legislature that are talking about this, as opposed to just saying, we promise more economic growth. Like, do I think it's enough in time? No. Do you think it's doable? Do you think you can well, change every, democracy? The vast majority of, of so-called democratic countries have some form of proportional representation. I mean, why the hell Canada can't do that? It's beyond me, right? If you haven't seen it, take a look at Elizabeth May's talk, uh, TED talk from, uh, What's the main park in uh, Stanley Park? And, and you'll believe in proportional representation. And it doesn't give me a, tr a tremendous amount of optimism, but it raises the level of possibility. That's all I'm hoping for now. Re raise the level of possibility. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, you talked about the, the fact that Canada is under Yeah, the Quick Sustainable Living Project, if you're not aware of it, uh, was a project that, uh, that Ron Schrimmel and I talked, uh, talked them into, essentially. Uh, and the, the focus was on a, a chunk of land that was going to be a sustainable community. Uh, kind of like what I would like to see on the endowment lands. Uh, the... Uh, the building got built, and it was a fantastic building. It was, the uh, the mayor of Craig gave me 10 sheets of paper that listed the people from other countries that came to see the Craig Sustainable Living Project. 10 sheets of paper. There were countries I'd never even heard of. My geography isn't great, but I'd never even heard of some of these countries, right? Uh, uh, I ran into someone down in Arizona and I said I was from Saskatchewan. Oh, you know about the Great Sustainable Living Project? <laughs> Unbelievable! Okay. The main building burned to the ground. I don't have any evidence, but I, I look at that building and I thought, that building cannot burn to the ground without help. It's got a cement floor. It's huge, post and beam construction. There's no intermediate fuel to support a fire. It's got stuccoed straw bale walls. You can put a blowtorch on a stuccoed straw bale wall and it doesn't do anything. 
when forest fires go through and hit straw bale houses that have been stuck over, the house is still standing. It's the only house in the whole area that's still standing. It burnt to the ground. Uh, there wasn't unanimity in the, in the community. We lacked unanimity. That was one thing. So they kind of lost control. Uh, it had no support from the province other than when they cut the ribbons to open up the eco center, right? So no support. In contrast, in Edmonton, they built a sustainable community uh, that is going to house 30,000 people on half the land that we've got uh, with the uh, university. And they had to start with an old airport where they had to tear everything down. It seems to be doing well, and they've got a whole book on how to do it. The first, the first rule of theirs about getting started, if the opportunity exists, seize it. The university in the city is not seizing an incredible opportunity for those endowments. All they think about is how much money it's going to bring to the university. That's obscene. All right, maybe I'm off track. <laughs> but the, the, the Craig Sustainable Living Project was an interesting thing. The people that were involved were completely committed, but they didn't have the support needed to carry it off. They just lacked the support. Um, we just have a question online. Um, so they want to know if there are any current humane theories on how to reduce the human population. Uh, sir, quit having, quit having babies. Right? Lower the number of babies that you've got so that the birth rate is less than the, the death rate and the population goes down. Right? It's very important to know that the relationship between humanity on the planet and the carrying capacity is something that we've got no real control over. If we don't have the plan, nature's got a plan. It's a plan. It's called disease, war. Uh, it's called uh, famine. And it's not pretty. Nature. Uh, doesn't really care uh, how it addresses problems. It just it just happens. Uh, so we have to have a plan. I mean, uh, people uh, in the noon hour call show were saying, "Well, how the hell can you tell us how many kids we can have?" Do they tell you how fast you can drive a car? Do they tell you how many spouses you can have at a time? Do they, they're telling me I can only have one wife? My God! Infringing on my freedoms. I mean, it, it's all a matter of our, what we'll accept as a culture, right? Will you eat bugs or only you know, pasta? So, I'm not suggesting that we can get to where we need to be in an easy way. I think it's going to be damn hard. I know from Rhonda and my experience that cutting down by half is pretty easy. If we had to cut down by half again, which we have to do, that's not going to be easy. That's going to be painful. A lot more painful than emptying my composting toilet like I had to do this morning. That's easy in comparison. I just don't think that we, I don't think it's right to tell people, give them the hope that we can do this. It's easy. Because it's not easy. It might be easy and it's going to get more difficult as time goes on. You know, I mean, one of the things I, when I was looking for whether there's any reference to reaching 8 billion people in the, in the newspaper, I uh, saw that the, uh, that the UN ranked Canada 58th 
out of 63 countries in terms of their, the way they're uh, addressing climate change. We're 58 out of 63. That was an improvement. We used to be 61 out of 63. That's abysmal for the country that should be able to model sustainability. to take a look at our methane emissions on the prairies in Saskatchewan and Alberta, right? He said, it's a business. We are way underestimating how much methane is being released. At the same time, Stephen Gabot at the COP27 meetings is saying, Canada has almost eliminated methane emissions. That's a lie. That's an outright, bald lie. 50 foot line. So, um, I don't go around telling people, oh yeah, recycle your pop bottles and we'll really reach zero emissions by 2050. We won't. Yes? Uh, city dwellers tend to uh, use fewer resources and have fewer children, so could increased urbanization be part of the solution? It, it, it might be. I mean, uh, uh, they, you know, they've got better education and hopefully, at least in Canada, most of the people living in the cities are, are uh, maybe better off financially than, than people in rural areas. Although that, that may not be uh, accurate either. Who knows? Um, I see a problem with the rural urban shift. And the main problem is we're going to raise a generation of people that have no idea how the real world works. We've just brought in a captive wildlife regulation in Saskatchewan over the last year. Makes it illegal for a kid to have a garter snake. He can buy a poison dart frog at the pet store, but he can't have a garter snake. He can't keep a mouse. He can trap a mouse. He can't keep a baby crow. Unprotected. He can shoot as many as he wants, but he can't keep one alive where he might get interested in biology, maybe go to university and become a biologist. That's what happened with me. Right? I raised baby birds. So I, I, I worry about the rural urban shift. I, I, you know, the people, the kids growing up there, unless we make a huge effort, think that milk grows in bottles when you buy it at the store. So I mean, that's my concern about the urban shift. I'd like to see more people on the land. Uh, I'd like to see us going back. Uh, no, no, I better not go there. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. It gets too crazy. Is there anybody else online? Yeah. No. Get one more question over here, So did you look at any of the data from when COVID happened and the world pretty much slowed almost to a grinding halt because we've never had that in our recent history. And like, I know there was definitely some huge things that came out of it because that was like, you know, a science experiment that never would have been done otherwise. And from that, were you like, did you have a look at whether or not grinding to that kind of uh, slowdown is, uh, like how much of a difference it made. I, obviously, I mean, that's not where we want to go because it was, you know, yeah. there wasn't a lot going on at all for anyone, but I mean, it'd be interesting to see, you know, like without so much travel and things like that, how that affected it. Well, I was going to try to get back to one of these slides. Uh, I mean, if that, the, the, the slide of population growth, if you saw that as the energy usage of the world. During COVID, there was a little dip, at least on the graph that I saw, a little dip down uh, for the last couple of years, almost imperceptible. My guess is that uh, uh, 
uh, unless we do something radical, uh, that can be eliminated and, and it'll be hardly perceptible. Just like uh, the uh, pandemic of uh, the early 1900s is barely perceptible on a graph of the human population. It is, you know, the impact is so small that uh, it just doesn't show. It's really cool. I would uh, suggest two reasons here. There are in the book. Uh, uh, I forget the title. It's something like um, Crisis in Civil uh, Crisis. Civil Civilization. <laughs> Civilization <laughs> in crisis. In crisis or crisis? Critical. Critical. Civilization critical. It's a great book. Reed Stone by William Reed. He's just spot on. He's done, he's done the homework. He's done the math. Darren in, uh, introduced me to uh, Bob, Bob uh, Smith, uh, an emeritus professor now from the University of Manitoba. Didn't know he existed. Never heard his name until I read his book. Man, I mean, this guy is phenomenal about everything. Right? Could you say that name again? Bob, Bob uh, Smith, is BC. L E D S N it's S N I L in his book. Uh, there's some forty books, and Darren tells me that uh, that uh, some of them are for reading and looking at, and others are more reference books. <laughs> I've got one of his reference books right now that I've got in the library. And I see what Darren's giving me. Still on page five. I had it for two weeks now. Well, if there aren't any books, do you have time for one more question here? Well, it's not really a question, but I was in engineering at the U of S in the 70s. And uh, we were, uh, we, it was explained to us by one of the, it might have been the dean of the college, but they have now developed, this is at the time of the 70s, they've now developed a very sophisticated computer model that um, it was talking about limits to growth. And they played around with all kinds of inputs as far as how much food we could grow, how much uh, energy we use, what the population was, et cetera, et cetera. And then they backed it up 100 years and it was able to success to accurately predict what the situation was now in the 1970s. They knew the model was getting pretty good. Then they extrapolated forward and they played with all kinds of different variables and every time the computer eventually comes up against the, the limits of the planet. Yeah. And then we were asked about some of these inputs. And there was only one, there was one critical factor that if they didn't change that factor, no matter how they played with the other things, that the date could change, but it always predicted that final limit. And what was that factor? And I told that out to people here tonight. What was that factor? I think Lynn will come up with it right away. Population growth. Population growth. And it only makes sense when you think about it, doesn't it? I mean, there's obviously some limit to how many humans we could have on this planet. But that uh, it'd be interesting to have access to that computer program now and see, you know, what it's predicting given the situation we have today. Well. They, they've done that analysis. I mean, there's uh, several, I think at least two books on uh, revisiting limits to growth and how well okay. the, the model has done. And it's done, or I can see, very well. Um, like, like you say, you know, uh, it, it was condemned by most economists at the time. 
uh, and those politicians, they're still condemning it when they say we can have limitless growth living on a finite planet. Uh, uh, but in reality, it's it's very close to what we're experiencing now. Yes. Yeah, I just want to uh, point out that uh, you put a lot of emphasis on population growth and that aspect of it, but uh, reducing population growth is also a function of reducing poverty. People who are well to do have very few children. People who are very, very poor, they have lots of children. Yeah, yeah the, the problem is we're already in overshoot, right? Uh, it would be great if everybody was driving an electric vehicle and had photovoltaics and things like that. But to produce those things requires more CO2 in the atmosphere. To bring people out of poverty, more CO2, unless, unless what we're doing to bring them up out of poverty comes out of our wallet. If it comes out of our wallet, then we're neutral. Question is, how far are you going to your wallet? I mean, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, let me re-emphasize one other thing. I mean, th this whole business that we're in, in uncharted waters. You know, everybody understands that we're in a period of incredibly rapid change. Everything is changing. Every generation is seeing the world differently because we've got different technologies and, and things like that. For 99.9% .9 of the time the human species has been on the planet, you would have lived the same way that your great, great, great grandparents lived and the same way that your great, great grandchildren would live. It wouldn't have changed at all. That's what we've evolved in, right? A world where change was so slow it was almost imperceptible, unless there was some asteroid in there. We're, we're not made for this rapid, rapid change. Drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think what I do is I, I think this thing, right? <laughs> all this changes and now I'm <laughs> Yes. I'd be interested to see what could happen in terms of population decline if there's any model. <coughs> A bit like, you know, the one that goes up. In response to cultural factors, economics, whatever, whatever. I mean, people are stopping. A lot of people are not having kids anymore, right? Yeah. And look what's happened in Saskatchewan. When people first came here, you know, everybody had 10 kids, right? So there's that factor, too. So, I mean, factors, <coughs> if those factors come into play to a certain extent in the world. In, in the yard. Yep. Yeah. How quickly... Or what are the possibilities for population decline? Is there a point where you get so that it just keeps falling? Well, theoretically, the UN says that's going to happen uh, later in, in this century. That we're going to hit a population high that's probably a little bit less than 11 billion, and then we'll go into de a decline. The question is, will it be a tr relatively slow or small decline, and then we reach some kind of a stabilization, or is it going to be a rapid descent and crash? Uh, right, the last billion people were added to bring us up to 8 billion, it took 12 years. 12 years to add a billion people, right? I thought the, next, the, the next billion are going to come in the next 15 years. And then the next billion after that, will take a little bit longer and then theoretically, theoretically repeat. But you have to understand exponential growth. If we wiped out everybody on the planet, except one man and one woman, we won't talk about inbreeding or things like that. If the woman had four children by the time she's 25, how long would it take to get back to 8 billion people? 800 years, 800, that's exponential growth. We do not think in terms of exponential growth. We think of arithmetic growth. Yep. You know, my, uh, my 
waistline is increased by half an inch. Then another half an inch. It doesn't go half an inch, then an inch, then two inches, then four inches, then eight inches, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 120, 256, 512, 1024. 10 doublings. You go from one to a thousand. You go from a thousand to a million. You go from a million to a billion, a billion to a trillion, with each ten doublings. It's mind-boggling. So I mean, we've got eight million people in the world right now. I mean, uh, my neighbor has twelve kids. How many women have to forego having any kids to make up for that? So, I mean, exponential growth can, can turn things around incredibly rapidly. You can think that, you know, oh, the population coming down, we're good. Yeah, could, again, if cultural changes take place in the wrong way, they could shoot up at, at, at the rates that we've been experiencing over the last uh, several decades. You know? Yes. Uh, you mentioned population growth as a negative factor. You've mentioned how more people means more resources, means more impact. Uh, and you mentioned that women uh, getting educated and pulled out of poverty reduces uh, population rates. You've also mentioned how nature has a plan, and that plan is to kill everyone. But have you thought of any way we could do it, uh, a rapid population dip in a humane way that doesn't involve murder? Sure. Second coming, and they say you will not have any more than one child. And if you disobey that, uh, then you get murdered, right? <laughs> it's it's typical. When my Dad told me life wouldn't be easy. I had no idea that he was talking about this. Right? <laughs> well, maybe we should do a little bit of a break. I heard him on CBC radio this morning at what, 7.30? Uh, 7.10. So, 